where we can experience a lot of fascinating informations and we have got experiences for our budding scientists as well. In this session, we will have three greatly informative sessions by our esteemed invited speakers, Professor Madhu Chopra Ma'am, Professor Sunil Kumar Sharma Sir, and Professor Douglas K. Grodzen Sir. Grodzen Sir will be giving his lecture virtually. So to start the big, uh, this session, I would like to introduce our eminent chairperson for the session, Professor Mahen Nath Sir. He completed his BSc and MSc degree from University of Lucknow, Lucknow, India. He earned his PhD in 1996 in chemistry from Central Drug Research Institute, Lucknow. Professor Nath worked as a research associate at CDRI, New Delhi, and as a post-doctoral fellow during 1997 to 1998 in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology at University of Alberta, Edmonton, Canada. Later, he joined as a scientist in the Department of Organic Synthesis, Lupin Un Laboratories Limited, India. In December 2001, Professor Nath was appointed as an NIH postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Chemistry at Indian University, Indiana University, sorry, Bloomington, Indiana, USA. Presently, sir is working as senior professor in Department of Chemistry, University of Delhi. In addition to various aspects of synthetic, heterocyclic, and medicinal chemistry, his current research is focused on novel anti-malarials, antimicrobial agents, and peripheral functionalization of porphyrins and biomimetic metallic metalloporphyrins to develop new phototherapeutic agents for applications in photodynamic therapy. Sir has many uh, publications to his uh, accolade and uh, without delaying this session I would like uh, now like to invite our chairperson sir to take over the session. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon uh, to all and uh, we start uh, this session uh, I am very pleased to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Madhu Chopra. Uh, professor Madhu is presently working as a professor and coordinator bioinformatics facility, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Center for Biomedical Research, University of Delhi. She has received her PhD from Department of Chemistry, University of Delhi in 1995. Her area of research is drug development and mechanism molecular modeling drug design and bioinformatics and nanotechnology, nanomaterials and applications in drug delivery. She has more than 25 years of teaching experience and research publications of around 50 in reputed international journals. She has supervised about 20 PhD students. Professor Madhu is recipient of many uh, awards such as uh, drug discovery, Hekthon Phase 1 Award and DDH Phase 2 Award. With this brief introduction, uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Madhu Chopra to uh, present his work. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Uh, thank you, sir, for the kind introduction. And I would like to thank the organizer of this conference for uh, inviting me here and sharing some of the work that we have been doing at ACR for the last several years. Uh, the title of the talk is uh, How do we design new drugs using pharmacophore guided virtual screening and then take it to the uh, developmental pathway? So my date in the lab is divided into three basic aspects. We uh, use computational models. They may include uh, pharmacophore, building, docking, and determinations, or a uh, modern machine learning based method, and develop certain weak compounds against the uh, designated targets against certain diseases, for example, cancer, or antivirals, or antibacterial. We also try to um, take these molecules into in vitro assays or in vivo systems and check them for various applications. 
so that is in uh, in the laboratory itself we also study their detailed mechanism of action how they are interacting with the body or any uh, any cell line based system and we try to deliver these drugs through nanoparticle mediated delivery uh, in a in a drug discovery pathway we have several stages and we are trying to cover uh, our uh, research work at every, uh, all the stages for example initial screening of the molecules which may involve high throughput screening or virtual screening so several students are working at this stage so you can see once we have the hits generated in the lab we we try to confirm the hits by using some in vitro assays and then optimize them uh, sometimes we use some synthetic chemistry approaches also and uh, if we have some lead generated we try to generate or optimize it through modeling techniques we also try to look for the adme models or improve the pharmacokinetics of the drugs and of course uh, some some uh, thing between the pharmacokinetic and pharma pharmacodynamic we start, start working once we get some lead compounds so overall strategy in the lab is for all the projects we try to first design some computational pharmacopore take that pharmacopore for virtual screening for producing the initial hits we try to procure those molecules or if the uh, student is interested because we i'm working in biomedical research most of the organic chemistry students do not join there so if some student is interested in synthesis we try to synthesize we try to synthesize few compounds and then we take them to in vitro screening and then determine the biological activities the uh, workflow in the lab will be for almost all the project for which i'll be discussing the results later that we try to build the ligand based or pharma uh, structure based pharmacopore this means the uh, we try to look for earlier existing uh, molecules which are active against a particular target or disease target and then look at its feature which might be essential for bioactivity that is what is called as a pharmacopore identify it or we can look into the protein and protein binding site how it is interacting with the various inhibitors or drug molecules and from those contact points we can design the pharmacopore once we have this pharmacopore which is basically a computational model so when, once we have that idea we we take it to uh, databases to screen new molecules so those databases can be in house databases for example some molecules synthesized in the lab or they can be publicly available databases such as zinc database cambiel pubchem or commercial sources from where we can procure the molecules later on for example we have several companies which sell these molecules and we can screen those for example otava or the shellacam and maybe etc so we try to screen out Uh, using the pharmacopore certain compounds that will be giving some initial hits here so these hits or the initial compounds are confirmed through molecular docking uh, based studies and i'll show you how the docking is going to help us to modify the compounds further and not only docking which docking gives a static pose of the molecule within the binding site but later on uh, more computation studies are performed for example molecular dynamics which studies the kinetics of the protein and ligand how it is interacting once the interaction is established we get an idea of the affinity of the molecule for the protein so this gives, gives us some chance to screen out the molecules which should be tested in the laboratory they are procured and then they are put to the in vitro cell line based assays in the lab we study the detailed mechanism of action and recently i'll show you some work which we are now involving using the modern machine learning and ai based technologies so a few um, examples from the lab um sars uh, cov2 so covid19 was something which initiated every lab initiated some kind of work here earlier i was working mostly on the anti cancer drug development but sitting at the home at two in 2020 and uh, i think it was april may we initiated that started looking for targets in the virus and at that time we identified certain virus based on the literature study for example one uh, target was rna dependent rna rna polymerase which is called as rdrp and for those who are a little bit from biology knowledge they know that uh, this uh, covid virus this sars cov2 which is termed as it has several the uh, non structured proteins and you have several non structural proteins which are 
actually expressed and are vital for the organism to survive. So we picked up three targets, for example, the NSP12, NSP15, as well as some NSPs here for NSP3 and 5, which are important for our targets like RDRP or endometriosis, as well as the viral proteases. So this has started with the, uh, the design of the pharmacophore. So how do we do that? We look at the protein structure. If this is the protein and a ligand is bound inside the bonding site, these interactions which are a little bit greener here or some blue interactions which you can see some hydrogen bonds or some hydrophobic or some other pi uh, kind of interactions are there. They can be used to build a pharmacophore within the binding site. So what the pharmacophore would look like is something like this. So it tells me that some, some uh, functional groups in the form of hydrogen bond donor or hydrogen bond acceptors or hydrophobic should be there in the binding site which are interacting with the contact points in the protein. And this is a computational thing, so it is a model, it's a 3D uh, pharmacophore. This can be used to screen the molecules, that, that molecule which are basically fitting into this pharmacophore will be giving a high fit value and predicted high activity. So the search starts with the uh, death database generation. At that time, there were no known inhibitors for SARS-CoV-2. So database was generated by knowledge of the earlier SARS-CoV, uh, that was the SARS-CoV-1 and the related viruses like MERS or um, most of the viruses, they, they were there. Um, but but again, SARS-CoV-2, there was no inhibitor at that time known. So database was built from related viruses of the family, which was the MERS and SARS-CoV-1. So that, that, and we also picked not only the existing data bases or inhibitors from literature, we also picked up all the antivirals available, whatever were available at that time. Probably some of the antivirals will fit into this pharmacophore and it may have a good predictive activity. So approximately 19,000 compounds were there in the entire database. We performed the screening, which is again computational. So this each and every compound of this 19,000 will be mapped or tried to fit into the pharmacophoric features which are shown here. It will filter out with the high fit values. So approximately 990 molecules filtered and they were further filtered for the uh, essential pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics properties which are called as ADME properties. So ADME is basically the adsorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion of drugs inside the body. So they, there are certain parameters a molecule should have before it can be termed as a drug. So those properties were calculated, their toxicity properties were calculated and in the end after performing certain we got 97 compounds. These 97 compounds were then docked into the binding site of the RDRP, I think it is the endonuclease enzyme. So in the endonuclease the X-ray structure was available luckily. Very rapidly the X-ray structures of these SARS-CoV-2 targets came around April and May 2020 the targets were available. So western countries and even China. They were rapidly producing the work in this field. We should thank them also. And for those, the excess structures were not available. People like us were doing the homology modeling, etc., to create those structures. So in that, uh, we just um, screened it. Finally, we got uh, 10 filtered out compounds, which were filtered on the basis of docking scores. And those were subjected to the, uh, you can say, these, uh, studying the interaction deep into using the molecular dynamics um, environment. And some fits with, uh, uh, in this paper, we suggested three molecules, which were existing drug molecules. So we also used existing drug molecules. So we suggested that there is a molecule called uh, bryodine, which is a thymidine kinase inhibitor, and it is also a DNA polymerase. So it is an approved drug, which is used for herpes. It can be repurposed for the SARS-CoV-2. We also suggested one drug which is an anti-HIV, this bromothionyl deoxyuridine, which can be repurposed for SARS-CoV-2 as well as this nucleus P1 target uh, drug, which is the thymidine dithiophosphate, which can be repurposed. So this kind of uh, work at that time was only theoretically being done because we were just sitting at home and the uh, only thing possible was work on computers and do some work. We uh, also uh, submitted as a part of a drug discovery hackathon called in July 2020 by Government of India, uh, Ministry of Education and AICT together. 
they wanted to uh, uh, have more participation of students and teams throughout India. Approximately 350 teams participated in that hackathon to design new drugs against SARS-CoV-2. So this uh, uh, story was for the RDRT enzyme, the NSP12 of the uh, SARS-CoV-2. Again, the pipeline remains same. So you have the database generation. The database was already generated. You do the mapping, try to have a, a filter of fit value. Again, you filter it through drug likeliness filter like ADME or top, Topcat or Toxicity, etc. Or Lipinski's rule of five. Do the molecular docking and suggest some hits. So by this time, it was October 2020. We submitted it theoretically there. And the project was acclaimed. Yes, we got that uh, drug discovery hackathon was, was uh, uh, announcing that some award. But at the same time, we also procured these molecules. And few of them were, uh, the university had opened in August and we, we came to the lab, procured these compounds and sent these compounds for antiviral activity testing in RCB, Faridabad. And we found that two of the natural molecules with the structures are not disclosed here. We are inhibiting the SARS-CoV-2 with an equal percentage inhibition as the remdesivir, which was the positive control. Or I'm sure many of you might be knowing what remdesivir is. So the, uh, the affinity of one of the molecule was very close to the remdesivir and we are happy and we are taking it further. What can be done here? Can it now, it, it will go to all pipeline for toxicity evaluation and everything else. So this, uh, not only this, at that time it was a qualitative thing, whether this will be binding to uh, the um, uh, receptor or not was not known. So predicted the activity using some machine learning based algorithms. I'll come back to the last slide that how do we do this kind of approach for designing new drugs or virtual screening of uh, databases from there. And we found that the molecules which we are suggesting are all active and for this particular work which was submitted we got the award. The another work which we, is going on in the laboratory is basically the anti-cancer uh, drug discovery which we were pursuing and still pursuing in the lab and here we I am representing only the work of recent two three years or three four years not the old one so we are uh, working on SDK enzyme, CDK enzyme and another very very latest uh, target is the PAD2, which is the peptidyl alginine deaminase enzyme. So for, for the same thing, I said we are, what we are doing in the laboratory, this, uh, this target we have been working since 2010 or 11. And we have published a lot on drug repurposing on SDEC here and uh, a lot of things in combina combinatorial uh, 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 use of certain existing drugs we have proposed. So working in the same direction, we again pipeline our work by developing the pharmacophore and taking it through all the screening steps and here i can tell you the power of this virtual screening efforts is you can start with a huge number of molecules for example zinc database at that time when we were working had 8 million compounds so it's a it's a uh, thing around 2015 or so now zinc database has more than 20 million compounds so from 8 million compounds, you can see apply all the filters and coming down to 54 molecules is not easy until unless we have such technology. So and then at the same time, we also look at existing drugs can be repurpose new drugs here because procuring existing drug is much more easier than procuring these 54 molecules which are to be searched in various databases which company can sell it, whether it can be synthesized or not, it is a long process. So we, we, we uh, the pipeline was again the similar kind of approach. We found several molecules which are interacting within the binding site and which are very similar to a positive control also. Now this kind of interaction study suggests us to modify the compounds based on the earlier lead compound. So what this suggests is, for example, in these two papers, we suggested to the community, one was in 2018-19 uh, and one was in 2022. We suggested to the community that if in order to make an important SDEC inhibitor, which are the parts which are essential for binding to the receptor and which are the parts which can be modified. For example, you must have an electron donor group here. You must have an aliphatic linker here, which should be participating in a non-polar interaction. 
you must have a tricyclic or more than that ring for the specificity of a subtype of receptor and this group is essentially required to coordinate with the zinc based on this and the result of the pharmacophore screening we suggested to the community that certain modifications can be done into the lead compounds for example if this is the lead compound identified from the literature then we suggested how this group can be modified by taking the lead and we we we, we have published this work anyone interested can see this paper in molecular diversity so we have suggested that these molecules can be synthesized even though we could not synthesize but we have suggested to the community that these are some inhibitors which can be synthesized the uh, what we could do is we ordered few molecules whatever we could procure and most of them were existing drugs and these are certain statins and certain more uh, needs mean some kinase inhibitors so some of them were HMT CoA reductase inhibitor, some of them were HIV reverse transcriptase inhibitor or kinase inhibitor. And uh, their fit value tells me how well they are fitting into the binding side and the uh, pharmacophore. This is binding, uh, the docking score. All they have good docking score also and then tested in the laboratory. In the laboratory also these molecules you can see inhibited the enzyme at one micromolar and you can say 98% inhibition is there at one micromolar which is a very good uh, activity for the molecule. These two molecules, the work I am not uh, showing here, they have been studied in detail for their cytotoxicity, for their mechanism and everything has been done now in the laboratory. And this is a kind of initial data of what I have shown for this how do we determine the uh, bioactivity of the molecule? We generally order the kit based assays and perform the affinity of the molecule, whether it is inhibiting the enzyme activity or not. And this is a profile of how, what we do in the SDX, uh, this um, molecular dynamics study. In molecular dynamics, the, the protein and ligand uh, complex is subjected to a kind of computational dynamics. Their angles and uh, everything is varied and it is studied up, up to maybe 50 nanomolar or sometimes 100 nanomolar, uh, sorry, nanosecond, I'm, I'm so sorry, 50 nanosecond or 100 nanosecond. And we see the progress, how the potential energy is varying, how the initial structure to the final structure, its root mean square deviation is there. And what are the fluctuations in the amino acid, whether the structure is stable or not? What are the hydrogen bonds which are formed during this dynamics run? and what is the protein size, whether the protein is opening or not. So this gives them uh, confidence that yes, these molecules, the complex is formed, the docking has happened, and the complex is stable for certain nanoseconds. So similarly, this is another work which we are now pursuing for PAC2 anti-cancer target. And if I show the same pipeline, we have, we have now uh, six, six compounds, some of them are making excellent interaction within the binding site. It's a very new enzyme. Not many drugs are available for this enzyme. So to just summarize that we, we, we not only um, we can see what are the kind of interactions, but if some interaction, some uh, you can say some amino acid is here and you have a, a, a site for modification that also the software can suggest. This is again, you can see two of the lead compounds, they had affinity even better than the control molecule. So this was the only control molecule for this enzyme which is available. If you see uh, its binding energy, this is delta G binding, which is actually the free energy calculation. So it's minus 117 kilojoule per mole. And for these lead compounds, it is almost double, 234 and 297, which is three times the uh, control molecule. So we are very confident when we order this molecule and perform. So further work is there uh, being pursued in the lab. Now coming to the latest story, what we are doing in the lab is we were using this pharmacophore modeling and molecular docking and molecular dynamics and produce so many lead molecules. And then many of these uh, collaborators used to come to us that can you do a docking for certain molecules for us? Can you check their affinity? Can you check whether it is anti-cancer or not? So every time assigning a PhD student to a collaborator was so difficult. Either you should have a mutually agreeable student and a student works in the, that lab and a student also works in my lab. So we thought of developing a server, which is a predictor kind of thing. 
So this work initiated in uh, maybe two years ago, around 2021 or so, when the project was again given by DBT as Bioinformatics uh, Center. And uh, we, we, we developed some machine learning based algorithm. What is the pipeline of this thing is, it's a kind of, we, I always, even to the students also, I tell them it's a QSR kind of thing. The name is modern. Okay, so what we do is we have to have data of earlier existing molecules that we have so many databases, uh, PubChem, Campbell, you can download from, for your target, you can download thousands of molecules are available. So you prepare your database and based on certain bioactivities. So we have to just see whether they are IC50 values or PKI values or just simple affinity values are given. So you procure that database. And then there is a data engineering, basically. It's a kind of IT uh, thing that data, once uh, the spreadsheets are made, you try to see in that, in that particular data set if some missing values are there or some duplicate data are there, they are removed. Then the whole data set is divided into active set and inactive set. This threshold is set from literature value. So for, for a particular target, a nanomolar uh, affinity molecule can be very active and the micromolar affinity molecule can, I can term it as inactive. So a threshold of activity or spread of activity is checked and then around the mean we just divide the data set into the active and inactive sets and then further there are some descriptors are calculated for example uh, uh, compound properties can be studied there are there 2D uh, descriptors can be calculated or 1D descriptors can be calculated or many more thousands of such descriptors are there. So here we are trying to associate the structure of the molecule with the known chemical properties of the molecule. And then relate, so you can consider it as a y is equal to mx kind of situation. So y is your bioactivity, x is your descriptors. There can be a variety of descriptors. This is a simple description of this work, but it is much more beyond that. So once you have the descriptor calculated, you stratify your data, split now your data into 80 and 20 so 80 is 80 percent data is used for training set and cross validation the 20 percent data which has been left out or 10 percent can be used for the external validation then you have certain matrices to evaluate whether your model is correct or not once the model is built and then once you have this predictive model it can be used for anyone if i employ on, on the internet and you can just submit a molecule I'll show in the end and, and your activities will be predicted. So this is three case studies I'm showing. The work is not yet published. So uh, this is now data retrieval. For example, this is another target, DCR table. And you remove the unnecessarily data. You analyze the data. This is one of the slide of data analysis that how the bioactivities of the whole data is distributed on a normal. It should be normal actually. And then we divide the data in between. This happens when we calculate the descriptors. Can, can you see these, these many uh, dots are each descriptor of the, well, of the uh, compound? So if, if one descriptor is correlated with the activity and apparently another descriptor is also correlated with the activity and the correlation is very high, only one may be useful. So this is basically then goes into the feature selection. We use some statistical ma ma uh, things like variance threshold or some uncorrelated things are kept and there is a feature filter filtration and then you have further you take it to the model building which goes into the machine and then you have trained the data build the model this is basically the classifier model so in the classifier model the output will come like a true positive false positive false negative and true negative kind of very simple confusion matrix and then you can calculate the sensitivity, which is called as recall, specificity, or accuracy of your data. And if something is near 0.9 or 1, 1 is absolute. So this area under the curve is this thing, how the model is behaving. If I get a ROC of 1, this means absolute. Everything you put in, everything will be predicted rightly. But uh, this is another uh, SDX6, again, the similar kind of approach. And you can see here you have the uh, one of the uh, accuracy, which is very uh, beautifully 0.85 and specificity is also good enough. So this can be further used for screening. So when this model for the SDF was used for screening, you can see several of the known inhibitors popped up in the screening 
and with a very high so the the score which it gives the model gives is the probability of being active or inactive so if probability is more than 0.5 you have you can say that yes it will be an active molecule if it is less than 0.5 i'll say this is not active so the the positive control value that you see the probability of this positive control as that inhibitor is 0.9 and it is interacting within the binding site with a very high affinity so these are two experimental uh, uh, evidences which have been put here this is also another positive control this is another positive control and what is this is the database screen so now this gives me uh, uh, confidence that if its uh, seed of interaction energy is equivalent to the positive control and probability is also equivalent this can also act as inhibitor of the ester that is the kind of confidence we get so uh, this is another such case for telomerase also now i'll show you how we are developing the server even though it is not launched here it is just locally hosted on our server so we can be uh, in this particular case we will have um, we have named it the anklan like prediction so it's basically the acdr anklan and which is an inhibitor prediction server it is a, it will be we are thinking it will be putting as a web server we are uh, trying if it can be patented also the methodology section then we will be putting it on for users there the user has to submit submit its compound in the form of spy, smile notations and then he or she has to pick up which cancer target he or she is interested or he can uh, pick everything and then submit name it uh, the uh, put some name and press the submit you will be getting what you will be getting is whether the molecule is active and what is the probability of its being active and it will also calculate certain things about the molecule which is called as lipinski's rule for example the molecular weight log p number of atomic bond acceptor and very basic uh, idea about lipinski rule it will calculate so this is the basically um, this is what i wanted to show that this is the latest work what we have been doing at acbr so that a user is also benefited from the research which we are pursuing at acbr with this uh, i would like to acknowledge so many students have been working but the one work i have shown is highlighted in the uh, orange red here and uh, this is project scientist in the shoy uh, uh, this project scientist in the project and who has been developing this web server and also the machine learning this work a lot of work is being and of course uh, collaborators and funding has to be acknowledged and i would like to thank everyone for patience yes so all the background models are in house design in house design all the models are in house design that is the thing otherwise we are using those libraries which are there for machine learning abhi it's not open because we are in a process of patenting the background the models and the methodology we want to patent in first place will be launched Thank you so much, ma'am, for such an informative talk. Uh, I now request our honourable chairperson, Professor Mahendra Nath sir, to kindly felicitate our esteemed speaker with a token of gratitude. Uh, will be delivered by professor douglas b 
Bro Brotjan, Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, San Diego State University, USA. Uh, Professor Douglas B. Grotjan is an academic researcher from San Diego State University. Uh, he has contributed to research uh, on topic catalysis and alkene. The author has an H index of 38, co authored 145 publications. Uh, and received 4,327 citations, previous affiliations of the uh, professor include University of California, San Diego, University of Washington, and the topic of uh, his presentation is aspects of the molecular electrocatalysis of water oxidation. And this is going to be the online recorded uh, lecture. Uh, so I think we can start. Hello, um, I'm sorry I am not able to be with you in person. Sorry. Um, I have some mobility issues that prevent a long international trip right now. Um, thank you, Pratiba, for inviting me. Um, and Pratiba came and worked in my lab and worked, was a very hard worker and very, it was, she was fun. It was fun to have her in the lab too. I, you know, we all miss her. Those of us that knew her from that time. So um, let me talk about inorganic complexes as electrocatalysts of water oxidation. First, I'm going to talk about coworkers and people that help. Um, these students are in my lab now. You can see ones that graduated that worked on this topic. Uh, these students are in my lab now. Um, and then these undergrads were in my lab. Unusually, I usually have undergrads now, I don't, but a uh, visiting PhD student is with me, and Pratibo was was with me also. <clears throat> we have great staff, great access to x-ray structures. Thank you DOA for seven years of funding. Thank you, Diane Smith. She has been my co-PI on the DOE grant that supports this, but she died a year ago, October 22, and total shock and uh, we really miss her. Gail Chatfield um, is, is also emeritus. I should say I'm an emeritus professor at the end of the last year, but Dale is an emeritus faculty too, but he's an expert at mass spectrometry, which is really useful for something else that I'm not talking about today. So why water oxidation? <clears throat> Our planet's warming. We see evidence of this already. And, uh, you know, we helped cause it, if not caused it. We need alternative sources of energy that are renewable. And sunlight falling on the land gives us a thousand times the energy we need per year. So if we can just capture a little bit of that, we would be great. We, we would have no need for oil and so on. And um, we would have green energy too. Um, let's use sunlight and catalysts to create hydrogen from water. Okay, so the overall reaction is called water splitting. Typically, water 
here where sunlight energy and catalyst gives the elements. There's two half reactions, like with any redox reaction, and um, <clears throat> water oxidation in this case is using sunlight energy and a catalyst to make oxygen, but we don't really need that usually. We need electrons to do chemistry. We use coal. We use um, photovoltaics. This way, if we could combine um, two catalysts in an integrated system, we, we would get hydrogen fuel for storage, or we could use the electrons to reduce carbon dioxide. There's just a lot of possible reactions, things you could use the electrons for. <clears throat> Water splitting is really not new. <laughs> Eight, uh, 70 years ago, right? This, this uh, paper used, is a complicated apparatus and it highlights that water can be oxidized by cerium in the four plus state. It's slow at room temperature. It gets faster with light, probably with lots of intensity, it gets faster still. Um, <clears throat> Uh, heat does it also and catalysts do it. And this is this is one way to test water oxidation catalysts. So I'm gonna we're gonna see that going forward. Um, there's two proposed mechanisms for water oxidation. One is called water nucleophilic attack, and water on a metal loses two electrons and protons, and then this is the water nucleophilic attack step that makes the key OO bond. And we thought, hey, from our NSF funded research, we, we became very good at removing protons in a catalytic cycle. So maybe we can do this in the context of water oxidation. Um, it's actually harder than we thought. <laughs> um, took longer. Um, by nuclear reaction, you make two of these oxos and they combine to make oxygen. There's at least three ways to test catalysts in this chemistry. One is the sacrificial oxidant method that I talked about a little bit earlier in a closed system and measure the increase in pressure. Another method uses a sacrificial oxidant in a closed system. And you make less oxygen here. You don't, you're not looking for pressure, but you're looking for the oxygen with a Clark electrode. And it's very sensitive for detecting oxygen in the water where it's made. So the very first, you know, if you inject a catalyst into cerium four solution, and you start to see current for oxygen reduction through this electrode, there's no induction period, right? That's a way to test that. Um, it's the only way that I know of, actually. Um, and then this is measuring in the headspace. And at first, all the, all the oxygen's in here. There's none here. It takes a while. It takes 15 minutes to diffuse. So at the beginning, you could have 100% of the oxygen in here you start to see some bubbles like this. And then at the end, you would get 98% of the oxygen here and 2% and or so down here at equilibrium. You can also use electrochemistry, which I will emphasize in this talk. Um, lots of people are working in this field. Um, they, Ruthenium has worked tip, uh, particularly well. We need to use less precious elements, but it allows us to study things. So, you know, how could we make these better? If you make this ligand more rigid or turnovers, uh, a little bit faster rate. And if you had the anion in the active site, faster still and more long lived. So we thought, aha, let's vary the anion. Uh, but first, I'm just showing a bunch of catalysts that have pendant bases of sorts. And this one I want to really highlight, Yobe 
is an excellent chemist in this field. He's actually one of the leaders. And this compound in, in carbon nanotubes gets a million turnovers, which is the best molecular compound that I know of at the moment. At the moment. Um, so here we are. This is the published catalyst, 2017. We wanted to replace the, the carboxylate with sulfonate or phosphonate. Now the sulfonate group we thought was going to could be interesting because even an acid it would be in a base. So we might have an active catalyst. Here's these three anionic groups in the active site: carboxylate, sulfonate, and phosphonate. And here's how much oxygen was evolved in a pressure in a closed system. And we measured the pressure. This is quantitative yield in, you know, six hours or so. Excellent result. And you know what? The sulfonate was my PhD student's idea. The phosphonate was my idea. Look what happened. This is terrible. <laughs> So it's always, you know, good for the student, really. You know, Aaron Nash, his name's not on here because these people did the analysis. Um, let's compare our sulfonate, whoops, sulfonate bearing catalyst with one that doesn't have it. This is not an exact comparison, but it's number two. Look at this entry, 0 0.001 micromoles of O per second initially. Our compound's 300 times faster. So that's excellent. That's an excellent result. And we'll look further. Um, so we use a lot of electrochemistry and I just want to run through this CV because you may not be familiar, familiar with the cyclic voltammetry. So you have a, a solution with your analyte and an electrode, working electrode, a reference electrode, and uh, um, and uh, reference electrode. And you start at zero volts versus the reference. Um, no current, no current, no current, no current. When you get to, I want you to look at the blue line. That's for our compound in nitric acid strong acid. So at about, you know, 0.9 volts, there's current. That's the oxidation by one electron of the ruthenium. And it's reversible, which is good. It shows stability on the electrochemical time scale. So 0.9 volts, let's go higher. No current, no current, no current. Aha! Current rises are called the onset potential. And when you get up to here, look at this. This is five milliamps per square centimeter. This here, 0 0.003. So more than a thousand times, the catalytic current, that's what this is, is more than a thousand times larger than the two, three couple. That is an amazing catalyst. Thank you, Aaron Nash and Colton Breyer who, for doing the electrochemistry. Let's compare our compound, that's this blue curve you've seen before, <clears throat> to a published compound which is uh, from TJ Meyer. It was used heavily in the, say, <laughs> 2005, eight, 10, uh, this compound is an iconic literature compound. And if you look at for three, the black trace, 100 times less current. And the reason this is very interesting is three is very fast using sacrificial oxidant in acid. But as an electrocatalyst, it's terrible. Um, very interesting. Uh, compound two is kind of in the middle. It's, you know, little 40 times less. This is 100 times less. So very high activity. And if you, <coughs> we have a dilute solution, 50 micromolar. Uh, if, you, if you normalize, if 
by millimolar, we have 40 milliamps per square centimeter. Um, this is called a Porbet diagram. It's a pH um, versus potential diagram, and, and, it's a, and it's a thermodynamic diagram. It's a state diagram. Let's just look at this, the, the Porbet diagram for this literature compound. Um, 0.8 volts at pH zero and, you know, let's say two. There's no change in the, the uh, potential in this region. So we're going from ruthenium two with a water. This is a mistake. It should be three plus to ruthenium three water, it was a three plus, right? So just chip, removing an electron. When you get to this region, say at pH seven, <clears throat> now we're losing an electron and we're getting, again, there's some typos, ruthenium three OH one plus. Yes, so this is the pH sensitive region. Look at our compound, very similar very similar until here it starts looking different. So these are thermodynamic diagrams. The thermodynamics, the sulfonate does not change the thermodynamics of the catalyst. It's changing the kinetics. That's very significant. Some computations. At the very beginning of the reaction, we don't have the whole reaction mapped out yet. Water, doubly hydrogen bonded, lose an electron and a proton. Now there's an OH, again, hydrogen bonded, lose an electron and a proton. You've got an O, it's a triplet. And there's about one spin on here and one spin on here. So it's, it's technically called an oxyl, not an oxo. Oxo would be a, a doublet or a singlet. Ongoing work. I forgot to put Prativa in here. She actually studied, let me talk about her work. Uh, she changed this ligand to one where there were an imidazole here and a second imidazole here. And we would expect that those are more donating and the ruthenium would be oxidized at lower potential. That's all true. The current, the catalytic current, was about 10 times less, at 200 millivolts less. So not so bad. You know, you lost some 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 catalysis of current, but you know, at much lower potential. The problem is, the catalysts that Pratima made were very insoluble. They were hard to work with. We couldn't get good. Elect, you know, we couldn't get real good electrochemical data. And they, they actually didn't get turnover numbers were lower, but she did do a very nice study of CH oxidation <clears throat> by the compounds and, and, you know, at a benzylic position, let's say. So she did a very nice job. We still have to publish the paper. That's my fault. Um, I do want to finish it in, the, in you know, this coming months. Um, okay, Miguel is changing the middle here. Um, and, uh, and especially this compound is significantly faster and stable. Uh, we want to look at changing the anion quite a bit, sulfonate, carboxylate, phosphonate, um, and do a thorough study of these. We've already analyze this, this compound is much worse, as I showed earlier with some other. And we really need a mechanistic study of the entire catalytic cycle. And we're working on that. Just looking at the time, I better get going. Okay, how do we determine the rate of catalysis from a CV? Two major ways, foot of the wave. <clears throat> Here we define it and show why it's unsuitable for a four electron, four proton reaction. Limiting current, next slide. So at right, I'm showing Yobe's beautiful catalyst and he uses foot of the wave. He's kind of a fan of it. 
And this is from his paper in 2016, talking about how to use Splinter Wave. Um, this is a CD. Basically, if you just stop right here, you know, nice reversible waves. There's actually a second compound in here. <clears throat> but if you say, right, if, and then there's the onset, <clears throat> and Saviant, the godfather of electrochemistry, and Constantine actually came up with Splinter the Wave. They said catalyst change, catalyst degrade, substrate depletes, you know, things like that. As you go on in the reaction, let's just analyze the beginning mathematically. <clears throat> and basically you need to, you need to, um, get the formal potential, meaning of the catalytic intermediate, which you can't do because you can't just remove the water versus the applied potential and so on and so forth. And they, if so this plot, if this is linear, that's well, kind of linear, um, you, using the slope, you get the rate. <clears throat> that's, that's a quick introduction. So limitations, we can never, never observe CV without water to get the formal potential of the catalytic intermediate. CO2 reduction, you can do it. Foot of the waves break for that. We have to estimate the formal potential using DPV or square wave. And we show in our upcoming paper that, well, these are, these are thermodynamic methods. So for the two, three couple, they work great. But for the catalytic wave, if the parameters of these experiments are changed, you get a different readout. So you can accidentally, you know, find the right formal, you know, estimate. And that's bad, because that really throws this off. I can tell you, I've, I've messed around with this equation. And yes, it makes a big difference. Um, Later work, theoretical work, showed the impracticality of using such a foot of the wave with multi-proton electron reactions. So we have to find a solution onto the solution. I'm gonna kind of speed over this. This is the two, three couple and the current. This is a catalytic current. The number of electrons for the couple and the number of electrons for the catalysis. And <clears throat> you can use these two equations. Ideally, you should have what's called limiting current. It really looks like this, right? These are, you know, it's an approximation. You can solve for K cat by combining these equations. And furthermore, K cat is has two components to it. KH2O, the inherent rate of this unassisted water nucleophilic attack, and then there's base assisted. And the amount of base can, can, can change that contribution and so can the identity of the base. Okay, but this, this relation is actually useful. Um, so we use that relationship, K-cat versus phosphate, and which should be linear and not necessarily goes through zero because of KH2O, but it should be linear, and this plot's horrible. Um, and this should be linear and go through zero, and again, this plot zero is horrible, right? Why? Because we use square wave voltammetry, flawed method. Okay, when you use our method, and I'm not gonna get into it because it's too much to explain, um, we get this optimal potential to use. And we have an excellent plot here. This is KH2O, KB, excellent R squared value. Uh, this is ICAT over IP versus inverse of scan rate, li uh, linear and goes through zero. Great R squared value. So we're, we're revising our paper for this and hope to resubmit it soon. Uh, what else are we doing? Jake Kerkhoff is just graduating. He made all these compounds and, and thoroughly tested them. Um, we have to 
do more with this. I tried to make this during the pandemic and I failed and Sun's group made, her, made it and they did a beautiful job. Um, what happens when you have several sulfonates? You know, is there an electrostatic effect that lowers the redox potential? Is there a base effect? And so these are two systems we're making. This one, I've actually made the ligand. I haven't had time to make the complex. The visiting PhD student, PhD student Mustafa, who's excellent actually, is trying to find good conditions to put a metal in here. And just to give you an idea what something might look with two sulfonates, here's a prediction. You can see strong hydrogen bonding and bending of the porphyrin. But if you have two sulfonates on the same ring, only one gets involved. But, you know, this may have an electrostatic effect. So we shall see. Conclusions and future work. This sulfonate group is really special in this compound. But why? <laughs> we still don't really know. Um, we need the full mechanistic study to actually delineate that. And, I, you know, I should have had Pratiba's compound on here with two imidazoles, but um, I talked about it. Uh, the variation of X can improve catalysis. This is Miguel Ibanez's work, and Asoxy's the best. We're going to vary the anion systematically and study the effect. We already made this terrible. Why? You know, we'll do a big computational study and and then uh, this is a very interesting area that we're just getting started in. So that's where we are. I'm right at 25 minutes. Thank you very much Pratiba again for inviting me again. I'm sorry I cannot come in person another time. So thank you very much everyone. I hope you enjoy your conference and again I'm sorry to miss it but um, another time. Thank you for your attention. Write to me, email me if you have any questions, and thank you very much. So let me thank him for his presentation. Thank you. So uh, the next uh, speaker of this session uh, is uh, Professor Sunil Kumar Sarma from the Department of Chemistry, University of Delhi. I'm very pleased to introduce him. Uh, and uh, Professor Sarma has completed his BSc, MSc, PhD from University of Delhi. And uh, uh, his doctoral work was in the area of synthetic and natural product chemistry. He has postdoctoral visiting scientist with such experience of more than 10 years at eminent institutes in Germany, USA, Denmark, UK, and Spain. He is a recipient of award from DBT, Royal Society of Chemistry Fellowship uh, from UGC, uh, Spanish Ministry of Education and Science, Spain, uh, and Denmark, and National Institute of Health, USA. Professor Sarma, current research interests focus on the organic synthesis, biocatalysis, responsive polymer-based functional materials, and nanotechnology. Professor Sarma has published over 138 peer-reviewed journal papers with average impact factor of 3.2, total citation is 2,800. Uh, and with the H index of 28, he has presented more than 100 research papers in different conferences and symposia uh, around the globe. He has uh, has been granted research projects in di different funding agencies from India and abroad. He uh, has been uh, a part of key office bearers of many yeah, national and international conferences organized by the Department of Chemistry, University of Delhi. Uh, with uh, this brief introduction, I, uh, I want to uh, invite Professor Sarma to present his work. Thank okay. you. So thank you, Professor Nath. And uh, 
actually once i when i was coming to this uh, college for lecture i was little bit uh, anxious that uh, how i will present but my friend is uh, chairing this session so i feel comfortable so thank you professor dat and uh, i first of all i would like to thank uh, uh, the chairman professor chauhan also principal of the college professor gupta and devanandan and uh, the organizers uh, dr pratibha and their team for the nice organizing of this conference because i know that organizing a conference at this level is not easy you need uh, to manage the things uh, maybe months in advance and uh, it is really appreciable so i appreciate uh, the whole team for the nice uh, arrangements over there and uh, i would like to start now basically uh, we are working in the area of uh, two areas uh, one is the synthesis of small molecules and also we are synthesizing the polymeric materials for their biomedical applications and today i would like to discuss the the polymer part amphiphile part which we are synthesizing for biomedical applications so you see that uh, when we talk of drugs then the drugs can be uh, taken or can be delivered by various means and you are already aware of that is it can be enteral that can be oral sublingual rectal or it can be parenteral that is intramuscular subcutaneous intravenous intradermal local or it can be topical also through your skin uh, that can be epidermic installation irrigation or through irrigation also uh, inhalation that is vaporization gas inhalation and nebulization and you see that uh, uh, you might have seen that when uh, the doctor prescribe a medicine for example paracetamol then doctor always say that you have to take three tablets of paracetamol one in the morning one in the afternoon and one in the evening and uh, i do not know uh, particularly for the students have you ever thought that whether the 600 mg tablet that we take for the purpose for reducing the fever for example is it used for the purpose for which it is taken or only a small amount is taken i do not know have you ever thought about it but you see that only a small amount is used for the purpose and this small amount varies for various drugs for example there are certain drugs for example cisplatin cisplatin is an anti cancer drug only less than 1% reaches the target site only 1% and the remaining amount either comes out of the body or it is responsible for for the cytotoxicity and this number varies but there is no drug there is no drug at all where the drug efficacy is 100% sometimes it is 15% sometimes it is 20% and that is the reason that when we take a drug the concentration of the drug increases and then it slowly comes down because it is metabolized in the system or it comes out of the system out of our body and to be of therapeutic effect the concentration should be maintained between this maximum level and minimum level only then the drug is effective and this is the purpose that the doctor always prescribe to take two medications a day or three medicines a day right but if we can circulate the same drug for 24 hours for example if we take a one paracetamol tablet and can circulate the one paracetamol tablet in good concentration throughout the body for the whole day then we need only one paracetamol tablet in one day so by this not only we can cut down the cost of the drug but also we can tackle the toxicity because each and every drug has a toxicity right so for that reason uh, people are working throughout the world in various ways how to uh, how to just keep circulating the drug for a longer duration and in this endeavor the drug delivery agents have a major role right because the drug delivery agent can encapsulate the drug and can circulate the, the drug in a body for a longer duration and hence it not only enhances the drug efficacy but also can can uh, uh, address the cytotoxicity issue so you see that most drugs which are available for example paracetamol for example crocin for example naproxen these are small molecules and their molecular weight is less than 500 right and many of these drugs are aromatic compounds and uh, since you are from chemistry background you know that aromatic compounds have less solubility in water right unless otherwise they have some 
groups which make it soluble they have limited solubility in water so solubility is another big thing that how to uh, how to solubilize it and that's why the drug companies uh, make formulations and they have to add lot of other things to make it uh, soluble uh, in the system and so that it can be given now they have short half life in blood circulation they can fastly diffuse into the healthy regions because the short the small molecule the small drugs cannot distinguish between the between the disease cells and the normal cells and they they just go everywhere in the body and that is the reason for toxicity and they have the fast clearance from the body low selectivity for the target tissue because if you want to bring the drug to tumor site but the drug do not have any mean to go only for the tumor site it will spread through the throughout the body right and low amounts of the drug reach the target tissue and no constant level of drug concentration this is these are the, all the challenges all the issues that we would like to discuss or that we would like to address by de developing drug delivery agents you see that uh, uh, we have already discussed about it that the drug has to be in a particular window to be have a therapeutic effect you see that drug delivery system also has certain requirements the premium requirement is that drug delivery agent should itself be soluble in water because our biological fluid is water based so the drug delivery agent is not soluble in water if it is low for soluble in chloroform it is of no use if it is soluble in acetone then it is of no use so drug delivery agent itself should be soluble in water but i have already mentioned that the most of the drugs are hydrophobic naproxen aspirin and paracetamol these are hydrophobic compounds right they are aromatic based compound they have limited solubility so the drug delivery agent should itself be soluble in water but it should also have capacity to solubilize the hydrophobic drugs so there are two different things the drug delivery uh, agent should be soluble but it should be capable of solubilizing the hydrophobic drugs so that is the reason that amphiphilic molecules have a major role because amphiphiles are composed of two kind of things having the hydrophilic unit which makes it water soluble and having the hydrophobic unit which is responsible for solubilizing the hydrophobic drugs that's why we are working on amphiphilic molecules now it should have a high loading capacity because if only a small amount of the drug can be loaded then again it is of no use right so the good good amount of the drug should be loaded and there should be controlled release because ultimately we have to release the drug from the from the drug delivery agent otherwise there is no use and it should be in controlled manner so that the concentration of the drug can be maintained in the body and it it is within the therapeutic window so that we can take only one tablet or we can take only two tablets throughout the day instead of taking four tablets or three tablets right now there should be good compatibility between the core forming block and the incorporated drug means there should be compatibility and also the drug delivery agent should be non toxic to our biological system because if it is toxic then again it is of no use so these are the all the parameters that should be taken into account while designing the drug delivery agent and there are two kind of drug delivery agent there are two mechanisms by which the drug delivery agent works one is called the nanoparticulate drug delivery system and here the drugs are physically entrapped and most of the time the non covalent interactions like pi pi interactions hydrophobic interactions and these uh, uh, these kind of interactions are the driving force for the encapsulation of the drug the other is the drug polymer conjugates the drug is attached through a covalent bond or through some bond to the drug delivery system but the they have some sensitive groups so this these groups exhibit sensitivity when they reaches the target site then this sensitivity is uh, is uh, shown and the drugs comes out from that polymer molecule and it is uh, it is uh, it is delivered to the target site so you see that i tell you that many of the drug delivery agents works on the principle of swelling the because the drug delivery agent after encapsulating the drug when it circulates in the blood because we have a aqueous medium and in the aqueous medium the drug delivery agent starts swelling and the, when the drug delivery agent starts swelling then it started slowly releasing the drug 
from the polymer molecule, right? This is the basic principle. So we have already uh, discussed about it that smaller molecules can escape by the voids. And you see, this is the mechanism that swelling is there and the drug is releasing from the system. Now, I have already discussed that why the drug delivery agent should be amphiphilic, why it should have a hydrophilic groups, why it should have hydrophobic groups. And you see that we already know about the micelle systems, right? The soaps and detergents are the well-known micelles and we are studying about these compounds from class 8. And these micelles are ionic compounds, right? You may ask me that micelles are also amphiphilic and they are known for hundreds of years. So what is the advantage or what is the need to, uh, to synthesize the newer kind of amphilic molecule? The thing is that micelles are known and drugs, this uh, soaps and detergents are forms micelles, but they are ionic compounds and ionic compounds have toxicity. Another thing is that our drug delivery agent should be able to form this kind of micellar structure at very low concentration and that is called critical micelle concentration. This is the minimum concentration at which the amphiphile forms a micellar structure. And it has been observed that soaps and detergents have very high CMC, high critical micelle concentration. And so when they keep circulating in the blood for a longer duration, they disintegrate. But if the amphiphile has a very low critical micelle concentration, then they will be able to keep circulating in the blood for a longer duration because they are stable, they have very low CMC and that's why the amphibolic molecules that we are designing and we are synthesizing have very low CMC. Now these amphibolic systems can aggregate and form different kind of structures as you can see. They can be bilayer, micellar structure, vesicle, steroid and cylinder and it depends on two factors and this factor is called hydrophilic lipophilic balance because our drug delivery agent has hydrophilic group and lipophilic group and it is a balance between the hydrophilic group and lipophilic group that decides whether it will form the micellar structure, whether it will form the vesicle, whether it forms cylindrical structure or whether it will form toroid. So there has to be a good balance between the hydrophilic and lipophilic balance. Now we have carried out the bio, studied the biomedical applications of these micellar systems and we have characterized these compounds by using dynamic light scattering, encapsulation is efficiency by using UV or fluorescent spectrophotometer. Also, we have used cryo-TM to know about their morphology, about the particle size. And also we have used the, uh, the either the fluorescence or UV absorption method to study their release, right? I will discuss in the next two minutes time. Now, the drug delivery agents have particularly been successful for tumor targeting, right? And I would like to discuss or I would like to share why. You see that the tumor cells are fenestrated, like these are, these are the normal cells and these are very, very closely packed, right? And these are the tumor cells. This is one difference. Another difference is the tumor cells have acidic pH, pH 5 to 6. However, the normal cells have pH 6 to 7. Another thing is that if we have an anti-tumor drug, which is a small molecule, the small molecule cannot distinguish between the normal cells and the tumor cells. And that's why it will disperse in both the kind of cells that is responsible for cytotoxicity. However, if we encapsulate the drug, the small drug in a big polymer thing, then it becomes bulkier, the system overall system becomes bulkier and it will not pass through the normal cells as you can see here and the, it, can the, uh, it can easily pass only through the tumor cells. So this is the principle that the, why the tumor targeting can easily be done by drug delivery agent. Another thing is that I have already mentioned that the tumor cells have acidic pH, right? So we have taken into account this factor and we have designed and developed our amphilic systems which are acting as drug delivery agents because they have pH sensitive groups. And you know, the best pH sensitive groups are the ester groups, right? Because esters can hydrolyze 
and if, if we have acidic sensitive uh, ester group then it will hydrolyze and that will disintegrate the polymer and the, the drugs encapsulated will be released at the tuber side. This is our principle. So you see that we have designed a wide variety of amphiphilic systems and I would like to give an overview that why it, what kind of uh, amphiphiles we have synthesized. One is that we have first synthesized our linear chain of polymer, right? And this linear chain is only, for example, hydrophilic. But our amphiphilic, our our drug delivery agent should be amphiphilic because only hydrophilic will not be sufficient because it will be water soluble, but it will not form aggregate because if for formation of aggregate there has to be a good balance between the hydrophilic group and the lipophilic group. So we have attached, for example, we have synthesized a linear chain and we have some functionalities and we have attached the different kind of functionality or different kind of groups to make it amphiphilic. For example, we have attached alkyl groups, we have attached pulfluoroalkyl groups to make it amphiphilic, right? And to fine tune the lipophilic hydrophilic balance, we have been able to fine tune that, okay, we can attach 50% alkyl group, 50% fluoroalkyl group and so on, right? This is one strategy. So I would like to now discuss that the building block, the starting material that we have used for the synthesis of amphiphiles are biocompatible. We have used glycerol, we have used diglycerol, we have used triglycerol, we have used carbohydrates, glucose, we have used the glucitol and polyethylene glycol. So all these materials, as you might have already have an idea, that glycerol is something which you which we use for mouth ulcer in a household, right? It is non-toxic. And we have oligomerized glycerol to diglycerol, triglycerol, and used as a building block. Glucose is non-toxic. And uh, this uh, glucitol is non-toxic. Polyethylene glycol is another compound which is FDA approved and is frequently used in the cough syrups for the formulation, right? So the amphiphiles based on these systems aggregate and form micellar structures. And the inner side of these micellar structures is composed of the hydrophobic units. And so it is lipophilic. And this facilitates the encapsulation of the hydrophobic drugs inside the cavity. And as you can see, that the outer periphery has hydrophilic groups. For example, they have carbohydrates. They have uh, this uh, glycerol. They have polyethylene glycol which makes it water soluble. So overall the system is water soluble, but we have a hydrophobic cavity that is responsible for the encapsulation of lipophilic drugs, right? So you see that I have already discussed that hydrophilic lipophilic balance is very important because if the HLB value is less than nine, then the compound, then the degradable agent will not be soluble. And if it is more than 12, then again, it is too much soluble in water. So normally we make attempts to keep the HLB value between 9 to 12. So this is the simple chemistry and uh, you may interrupt even if you feel, I mean, if you have any questions. So we simply took glycerol and use vinyl acetate. It is an acylating agent and we use enzyme. You see, in the presence of enzyme, because there are two kind of hydroxyl groups, the two primary hydroxyl groups and one secondary hydroxyl group. And this is the beauty of this reaction that in the presence of enzyme, the reaction occurs selectively at the primary position and the secondary uh, hydroxyl group remains intact, right? So we have used this to convert glycerol to glycerol diacetate and this hydroxyl group can then be used for further functionalization. So we have carried out the methylation Methyl, methyl group is a good living group. And then we have converted this methyl derivative to the azide. And you see, the purpose of using the azide is so that it can be used as a building block or one of the building block for click coupling. You see that the click reaction has become very popular in these days. Even the Nobel Prize last year was given for the click reaction, right? Because so many compounds have been synthesized based on the click reaction. So this is our one of the building blocks, simply azidoglycerol. And we took uh, PAG diol, which is commercially available, and then converted to PAG diacid by simply carrying out an oxidation reaction, and then carried out the PAG diester synthesis. And the next step, we simply mix 
the our glycerol system and packed diester in the presence of a enzyme and a polymerization reaction occurs via trans esterification reaction and we get the block copolymer this block copolymer where the group r can be oh hydroxyl group or it can be azide and we have functionalized this oh or azide by using different kind of groups for example we have attached the alkyl chain of different length you can see here through this uh, oh group or we can carry out the attachment of different functionality through the click reaction as you can see so this overall these final molecules become amphiphilic because this block copolymer is hydrophilic it is made up of peg units only and glycerol which are both water soluble but when we attach the alkyl chain then now we have the hydrophobic group and we have the hydrophilic group and these amphiphilic systems can we can just one minute and it's equal to this is a degree of polymerization that is the degree of polymerization i mean how many units anji how do you find out oh this is uh, okay okay the degree of polymerization can be can be measured by different uh, means polymer is one thing oh, sorry nmr is one because end group analysis and also we can do the gpc right the gel permeation chromatography so these are the two techniques that we frequently use for this end group by nmr or by gpc right now you see that uh, we have attached different kind of functionalities over here at this position right and uh, this is an overview and uh, we have attached the alkyl chain of different lengths because initially we were not sure that which alkyl chain size should be perfect to have the drug delivery agent to have a perfect drug delivery agent and while attaching the different alkyl chain we observed that the c18 alkyl chain has a better encapsulation efficiency right when we have a longer alkyl chain similarly we have attached the this is called polyglycerol dendron this is generation 1 dendron g2 dendron and this is hyperbranched glycerol we have attached these compounds also we have attached perfluoro alkyl chains and we have attached the mixture mixture also like alkyl chain perfluoro alkyl chain in different ratios to impart hydrophobicity you see that perfluoro alkyl chain is particularly worth uh, mentioning here that the fluoro alkyl chain behaves entirely differently than the alkyl chain for various reasons for example they are strongly hydrophobic perfluoro alkyl chain are much more hydrophobic as compared to the alkyl chain they form well organized assemblies and they have all trans helical configurations more bulky stiff chain and they have higher surface activity right and also they show promising anti fouling agents and play potential role in drug delivery and biomedical applications so we got very interesting results when we have used perfluoro alkyl chain you see besides the linear amphiphiles we have synthesized small small amphiphiles also and these amphiphiles can be classified as linear bola and gemini gen dendronized genus dendriber depending on their constitution depending on their structure and we have synthesized these kind of small amphiphiles also right and these can further be classified as ab system a to b system ab2 system or a to b2 system and in the next 5 minutes i would just like to give you a brief glimpse that how this different kind of systems have been synthesized so this is a overall picture that we have synthesized a wide variety of amphiphilic systems as you can see here and coming to the system of ab or ab2 right we simply use para hydroxy benzoic acid very simple molecule the para hydroxy benzoic acid has two groups acid group and the hydro, uh, phenolic group right and we first carried out the mitsunobu reaction to attach this glycerol derivative over here right and this is acid now we have again two functionalities the acid and the alkyne so this is the acetylene group this group can be used for click reaction and this can be used for esterification reaction and we have synthesized this kind of ab2 kind of amphiphiles here we have this is the ab system this can be used for the click reaction this can be used for the esterification reaction and here we have this kind of ab amphiphiles right so this is the full strategy starting from glycerol glycerol diacetate 
that Mitsunobu reaction to get this compound. And then this compound was hydrolyzed. As you can see, the acetyl group was hydrolyzed. And then we treated with the propergyl bromide to have these propergyl units. And finally, we carried out the click reaction to have different kind of m synthesized. And we have attached the carbohydrate moiety as a, as a hydrophilic moiety and the alkyl chain as a hydrophobic moiety. And, and also we have used the PG2 dendron as a hydrophilic moiety. We have used PEG unit as polyethylene glycol as a hydrophilic unit and alkyl chain as hydrophilic unit. You see that carbohydrate is hydrophilic here, here PG dendron is hydrophilic, here PEG unit polyethylene glycol is hydrophilic. And then we studied the encapsulation behavior of all these kinds of amphiphiles. The A2B2 polymer, we started with 5 hydroxy isothalate. And uh, you see that here the alkyl chain is hydrophilic unit. The hydrophobic hydrophilic unit is PEG, and the hydrophobic unit is alkyl chain. And this is a core, central core, right? So we started again with the same glycerol diastate and carried out the, this time the Witsurovo reaction on 5 hydroxy isothalate, right? So we have this A2B2 core uh, prepared. Then simply we carried out the esterification reaction, this bromopropergyl bromide, and uh, we have this the two acetic units can again be used for the click reaction, and we can use alcohol for the esterification reaction. Very simple, very very simple chemistry is used, and only very easily available starting materials have been used. So we have synthesized again a large variety of amphiphiles by varying the peg size. PEG unit is available of different size and it has a uh, like PEG 550, PEG 1000 and alkyl chain is also available of different size C9, C12, C15, C18 and we synthesize the various combinations just to come up with a robust drug delivery agent. So uh, this is again the, the strategy. We have used the diglycerol as a, as a core also. You see that uh, uh, here the diglycerol, the same principle, the same chemistry is applied here that diglycerol was subjected to acylation reaction. Diglycerol again has the two primary hydroxyl groups and two secondary hydroxyl groups, as you can see here. And we can carry out the acylation using vinyl estate and we have the esterification at this position. And now we have instead of one, we have two hydroxyl groups, two secondary hydroxyl groups. And we again follow the same chemistry, convert it to azide and use these molecules for the amphiphyl synthesis, right? So we also use the triglycerol. Triglycerol was synthesized in our own laboratory. And these are the triglycerol based amphiphiles we that we have synthesized. And this is the strategy that we took this epichlorohydrin and we carried out this reaction with this, uh, with this compound to get this derivative. And then finally carried out the deproduction here and we, carried out, we got this triglycerol. Again, glycerol, diglycerol, triglycerol have the same primary hydroxyl groups and secondary hydroxyl groups. And we can distinguish between them by using the enzyme. We can selectively carry out acylation using the uh, using the enzyme. And again, here too, you, we can see that we can acylate the primary hydroxyl groups. And now we have three uh, secondary hydroxyl groups. And we carried out the Mitsurobu reaction to have this molecule. And this was a hydrolyzed. And now, again, we incorporated the propergyl unit to have the click reaction. And this OH groups can be used for acidification. And we can attach the alkyl chain. Right, so similar chemical strategy was used in all the cases. So these are the amphiphiles based on triglycerol. We have used the carbohydrates also, for example, glucitol. In the case of glucitol, we have synthesized uh, this kind of amphiphiles, as you can see. Here also, uh, you see that glucitol has six hydroxyl groups. So we first carried out the production of all six hydroxyl groups. And then, as you can see here, and then we carried out deep production, selective deep production of four hydroxyl groups, as you can see, right? And now we have the primary and secondary hydroxyl groups, and we can distinguish between the primary and secondary hydroxyl groups by carrying out the mesylation or tosylation followed by azidation. And we can selectively have the incorporate the azide group over here, and hydroxyl group is there. So azide group can be used for the click reaction, and OH group can be used for the esterification reaction, right? So we have uh, synthesized uh, the amphiphiles based on this system. As you can see, these are the amphiphiles that we have synthesized. If you need more details, then we can discuss because we have a limited time. That, that's why I may, I may not like to discuss much more. We have synthesized the 
diazo polymeric system you see the diazo uh, when we have a diazo system diazo exhibits cis trans isomerization and in the presence of uv light and this cis trans isomerization uh, can be used for releasing the drug for example here we have a this uh, because trans system is more thermodynamically stable but when we radiate with uv light then it goes to cis and because cis is not compactly packed as compared to trans and hence when we uh, the trans forms cis the drug is released because now the system is less compact as compared to a, the compact system right the drug is released we have we have studied this drug release by carrying out the fluorescence studies because here the the fluorescent intensity decreases when we radiate this transform to and convert it to cis as you can see here now the cis form can again be converted to trans again by using the uv light of different wavelengths as you can see here and we have not seen the complete reversal of encapsulation right because it is not a perfect system because uh, uh, we have noticed that though we observed the increase in the intensity but it was not a complete reversal so this way i mean we have used the diazo system also for drug delivery you see that uh, uh, here i mean uh, after uh, after synthesizing so many molecules i would now now to discuss only one example that these compounds the all of these amphiles have been used to encapsulate the various drugs hydrophobic drugs and to establish the encapsulation as efficiency we have used the dinyl red as a model drug dinyl red is not a drug it is used as a model drug because it shows intense fluorescence when it is in the hydrophobic surrounding but in the hydrophilic surrounding nile red does not show fluorescence so if nile red is encapsulated in the hydrophobic cavity then it will exhibit fluorescence and if it is in the hydrophilic surrounding then it will not show fluorescence and that establish that the nile red has been encapsulated in the hydrophobic surrounding and that establish the encapsulation so we have also compared the alkyl system with the perfluoro alkyl system that which system is better and you can see that this is a tm cryo tm studies that shows the particle size that these are the nano size particles and uh, these are the other parameters i would not like to just go into detail so we have besides nile red we have incorporated nimodipine and also curcumin curcumin as you know that it is a well known compound which is present in haldi and it has many uh, uh many useful purposes and recent study has shown that the curcumin can be useful for alzheimer's disease it is a brain disease but the problem is that the the drug which are used for the brain they have to cross the blood brain barrier and the curcumin and many other drugs are there which cannot cross the blood brain barrier and that's why they cannot be used for the the brain related disease and the curcumin is one of them so that's why people are now trying to encapsulate curcumin so that it can cross the blood brain barrier and it can be used for the alzheimer's disease so we have used that so uh, you see that i mean this is just to establish that we can is, i mean we can successfully encapsulate curcumin in the drug delivery agents and uh, what we have seen that because our amphiphiles are based on ester system and in our body there are hydrolases also right we have enzymes also these enzymes can hydrolyze the ester moiety these ester moieties can also be hydrolyzed by ph because the tumors have acidic ph so what we have seen that these systems in the presence of enzyme the fluorescence intensity of dial that decreases which means that the system is disintegrating and that's why the fluorescent intensity is decreasing because nile red is coming out of the hydrophobic system but without the enzyme you see that we have not seen a significant decrease in the intensity it means that the nile red which is encapsulated remain encapsulated without the enzyme for a very longer duration but in the presence of the enzyme the uh, because the ester bonds are hydrolyzed and so disintegration occurs and the fluorescence intensity decreases so that established that we can release a drug in a controlled manner in the presence of an enzyme uh so now another thing is that we have to establish that this is another study you can see 
that this is with the perfluoroalkyl alkyl chain and this is with the alkyl chain. But alkyl chain system is not that uh, perfect because alkyl chain system, they release, they slowly release the drug even without the enzyme. But in perfluoroalkyl alkyl chain, we have not observed anything. So perfluoroalkyl alkyl chain based amphiles have a better shelf life and they can be successfully used. Now, we have to establish because ultimately the drugs and drug relieved agent has to be taken in the cells. And we have carried out the control experiments with the help of our collaborators, biologists. And we have fully established that these olympophilic systems can bring the drugs inside the cells. So these are the experiments. So with this, actually, we have, so we have synthesized a wide variety of amphilic system. We have compared their efficacy. We have compared their capacity to encapsulate. We have compared their capacity to slowly release the drug. And we have made a comparison uh, in different publications. So this, I mean, basically, I am a messenger, right? Because it is a group of students who, I mean, they have worked and who have contributed to my research. And uh, I have a, a big group, actually, um, uh, and uh, this is the current group. I, I can see that uh, uh, the four people, Arthi, Golab, Sudhanshu, and they have recently, in the last year, these people have been awarded. And Dr. Atul uh, is also, I mean, have contributed to this research, and he's also among the audience. And with this, uh, I'm also thankful to the funding agencies, because this kind of research is not possible without the generous funding. And I have been lucky to get the uh, continued support from the various funding agencies, for example, DBT, DST, Polytechnic University, CSIR, Delhi University, DRDO, DART Germany, BIREC. And also, I am thankful to our collaborators. The major part of this, particularly the biology part, cryo -team studies, they have been carried out in the, the laboratory of Professor Dr. Reiner Haag, with whom we are collaborating for the last 15 years. And many of our students, almost 70% of students, have been trained in his laboratory. So, and I also am thankful to uh, other collaborators, Professor Watterson, Professor Jayant Kumar, Professor Parang, Professor Eji Raj, and uh, late Professor Ashok Prasad, who recently passed away, my, my best friend. So with this, I would like to thank you very much. And I will be happy to take uh, any question you have, particularly from the students. So presentation is open for the questions. Please ask the questions. Yes. Please. OK. Hello. So it's a very nice talk, sir. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to ask one thing. Yeah. Um, for the drug selectivity, we often choose the filtering agent, like Lipinski's rule. So, and, sorry, uh, you feel, uh, be, uh, Lipinski's rule, Weber's rule. Uh -huh. So this selects uh, small molecules mm -hmm. for the drug. Uh -huh. So in your case, uh, we have seen that key, the molecules are large enough. Means it is slightly bigger. No, polymers are so, larger, but the drugs are... Uh, curcumin is again, we have taken for example curcumin. Curcumin yes. falls in the category of less than 500 molecular weight. Naproxen is also in the category of less than 500 molecular weight. And we have at, at one point we have taken aspirin. So that act, that, that will act as a uh, carrying agent, drug uh, carrying agent that will uh, carry the drugs to the receptor. Our carriers are large polymeric materials. I tell you what, actually, uh, because of the time I have not shown you, you see, the drug actually, when it is when, when we take the drug, then before reaching the target site, there are many obstacles. I do not know, just like a sap CD ka khel hota hai na, bilkul waisa hi rehta drug ka, because there are many snakes, big snakes that will bring it to the that will just uh, niggle the, uh, the drug and that will bring it to the mm -hmm. bottom. And there are two things. One is the this is the filtration through the kidney. Kidney is a major problem. Kidney may filter ho jati hai. Yeah, recognized by the reticular endothelial system. This is called RES system. And the small molecules can easily be recognized by the RES system and they get filtered over there. They do not reach the target site. But we can address these issues if we have a polymeric system. Because of, if we have a polymeric system, then it becomes bulkier and it cannot be filtered through the kidney. So how problem solve okay. Dusra, our if our polymeric system is made up of Compatible materials, for example, carbohydrates, for example, polyethylene glycol, it is well established. Then it is not recognized by the reticular endothelial system. So there are two purposes the drug delivery agent is, is providing. One is that it evades the filtration through the kidney, and also it evades the recognition by the RES system. 
that's why polymeric systems are needed uh, in case of sir aspirin which we know yeah. uh, is a miracle molecule yeah uh, but the aspirin molecule is small yeah. and uh, it has shown lot of benefits so oh, actually maybe i am not able to communicate what i am trying to say here hmm. is that the small molecules can be filtered through the kidney can be recognized by the reticular endothelial system hmm. and this is a major problem that we cannot circulate the small molecules in the blood for longer duration that is the reason that we have to take three tablets of aspirin 600 mg right but if we have a polymeric system because it is something like this that if we have the this kind of system and aspirin is sitting here then if this system is there this cannot be filtered through the kidney and this system cannot be recognized by the res system and aspirin is sitting over here and it is safely circulating in the in the body for a longer duration so in the beginning also i tried to just convey this that this drug delivery agents can enhance the circulation time in the blood for longer duration because they cannot be filtered through the kidney i escaped that slide i should have shown you that slide that the kidney and the recognition by the res system are the two major challenges that we have to address by using the drug delivery agent is that fine okay uh, i think uh, there's no more questions so uh, let me thank professor sharma for a nice presentation great thank you very much sir thank you thank you so much sir may i now request our chairperson sir to kindly come on stage and felicitate our uh, speaker sir with a token of appreciation so thank you so much Okay, I now request our chairperson sir so to say a few words. Okay, so uh, in this particular te technical session, uh, uh, we had three uh, very nice presentations, and the first presentation uh, given by Professor uh, Madhu Chopra is related to uh, the repurposing of drugs and try to find out. Uh, Uh, the lead molecules by using bioinformatics and then uh, going to in vi in vitro and in in vivo testing and second presentation was uh, is related to uh, the generation of hydrogen by the oxidation of water that is also equally important if you think about the energy problems and then uh, the last presentation was related to drug delivery systems where you can efficiently uh deliver the drugs by using different polymeric materials uh to the target site i uh, for a better release and better uh, uh, like uh, results so with this uh, i think i conclude uh, that uh, it was a nice uh, session and all the presentations uh, were excellent so and at the end uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to chair the, this session so thanks to uh, organizing committee and uh, uh, the deshbandhu college for inviting me for uh, doing this job thank you so much thank you